I want to talk about is intermolecular attractions. All right. But before we can talk about intermolecular attractions, we need to talk about what is a molecule. So this word molecule is thrown around. I think elementary school teachers sometimes even throw it around and they use it incorrectly. But a molecule is a group of atoms chemically bonded together. Right. So um, right here, I have a big molecule that includes nitrogen, and oxygen, and all sorts of stuff. Over here, I have some smaller molecules. I'm going to be talking about these four molecules a ton today. This is water, H2O, ammonia, NH3, carbon dioxide, CO2, and methane, CH4. All right, so make sure you, you know those molecules because they come up a lot. And does anybody know what this molecule is? Pretty famous one. It's the double DNA. helix. DNA. DNA, yes, thank you. Wow, that was tricky. That was tricky. Yes, it's DNA. Here's the thing. Nature makes amazingly large molecules better than we can. A good example of that is like epinephrine is a molecule that we can synthetically produce. You know, that's what's in EpiPens. But the only reason we can synthetically produce it is because it's a very small molecule. I mean, it's really hard for us to be synthetically producing this, which is why right now the COVID vaccine relies on our own body to synthetically produce um, segments of RNA, which I don't have too much time to talk about right now, but just so you know, those are all molecules. Uh, so we learned about three types of chemical bonds, ionic, covalent, and then this one is metallic. It's the one that we talked about the least. Ionic bonds are when they transfer electrons. This is very cute here. You've got this little guy electron that's transferring the ring, which is an electron over to the girl. Covalent is when you share electrons and then uh, metallic is when you share tons. Now molecules, molecules are covalently bonded. All right. So when we talk about molecules in this chapter, we're talking about all covalently bonded things. Ionically bonded things right here um, go on and on and on and on and on into crystal lattice structures. So that's an example of an ionically bonded compound. They're not like single molecules that interact with other molecules. They just kind of go on and on and on. This, this is representing just one part of an ionically bonded thing. Now, before I get you into thinking that covalently bonded things can't go on and on, there is a special type of covalent bond that makes what we call a network or a network solid. And it's a covalent bond that goes on and on and on, kind of like the ionic bonds, right? So diamond, silicon dioxide, which is a component of sand. These are things that are covalently bonded, but they're more networks like the ionically bonded things. Samples, this is an interesting fun fact, Samples of these, samples of diamonds are actually single molecules. If you have a, a hunk of diamond, it's actually considered a single molecule. I didn't tell you that other than so that you couldn't call me a liar later if you learned that molecules um, can be like that. All right, so molecules by definition are the simplest unit of a covalent compound. And molecules can be represented in a lot of different ways. And I wanna show you those. Okay, told you we were going to talk about methane, ammonia, and water a lot today. So here we go. We've got methane. Methane is CH4. That says there are four hydrogens attached to um, a carbon, right? NH3. There are three hydrogens and a nitrogen. These are called molecular formulas. We've already started working with these. But then chemists need to know a little bit more. They need to know how it's attached, right? If someone thought the CH4 was attached like this, they would be really, 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 really wrong. So we show a structural formula and we show people that CH4 is attached in this way. 
the C is attached to all four of the H's. Here's NH3, H2O, and here's oxygen, which is O2. So that's called the structural formula. That's still not necessarily good enough because they also have what's called a ball and stick model. And a ball and stick model is to show you this in 3D, right? So I got the carbon in the middle, here's the hydrogens. They often use the same colors for these. Oxygen is usually red, carbon black, nitrogen blue, but not 100% of the time. And then finally, um, the space filling model is, is very similar. Um, now this is a little bit loaded, this little pink box here. Each line represents a pair of bonded valence electrons. So remember I told you in covalent compounds, they're sharing electrons. So methane, for example, means that the carbon is sharing two, a pair of electrons with the hydrogen. And it's doing that four times. But it turns out that drawing a lot of dots gets messy, so they turn the dots into lines. So each line is representing those dots. And we'll come back to those dots. I just want you to kind of get that visual of what those lines are representing. I think of all the things they've done in chemistry, turning these dots into these lines was a great idea, all right? Now, unfortunately, we are 2D right now. Um, so it's kind of ironic that I'm telling you about this, but this is the structural formula, but then sometimes they like to represent it in 3D. Chemistry happens in 3D. If you have an artistic three-dimensional mind, you'll actually be better at chemistry, which is more than I can say for myself because 3D chemistry visualization is actually pretty tricky for me. Um, and they do something called perspective drawings and they just show you that it's like sticking out of the page, right? Here's that ball and stick. So they use things called wedges and dashed wedges, really fancy name for those there, to show that it's kind of sticking out of the page. Just shows you that this is not a flat pancake object floating around with four things sticking off of it. It looks like this in real life. And that matters when you get further on into chemistry. All right, this is like, um, I don't know, an old ACT question or something. All covalently bonded compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. Ooh. So all covalently bonded compounds are molecules. Good, we got that. H2O, NH3, CH4, cool but not all molecules are compounds. And these would mostly be right here, the diatomics. I call these the H7 club, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, the H7 club, there are seven of them that make some, they start with the letter H. They come in pairs. We call those molecules. So even though it's not an oxygen compound, that's not the right word for this, it is an oxygen molecule. So an oxygen molecule is just the element of oxygen in a molecule. There's also polyatomic molecules like phosphorus and sulfur that they're showing here, selenium. There's other ones on the table, um, other weird things that can happen over here in the noble gases. You don't need to know those. Most of the time we're just talking about the diatomics. All right, last kind of bookkeeping thing are lone pairs. Lone pairs are like alone pairs. It is a pair of valence electrons. Go back, a valence electron is an outermost electron that gets involved in bonding. That's what a valence electron is. In fact, the electron chapter all doesn't matter now. All that matters are the outside electrons. So a lone pair is a pair of valence electrons that are not shared with another atom. They just kind of hang out there. Sometimes they're called non-bonding pairs, right? The problem with lone pairs is that they're not always drawn. Sometimes they are, sometimes they are, um, but chemists always know that they're there. And you will too, I promise. The further you get on in chemistry, you will look at NH3 drawn like this and you will imagine 
the lone pair up there because it is so important. The lone pair becomes very, very, very important. You can almost think of it as like its own thing coming off. So you can think here, nitrogen in ammonia is bonded one, two, three times to hydrogen. And then it's got this lone pair that's bonded to nothing. All right, water it is always represented as what we call bent. And that's because it has lone pairs. They don't always show them, but they're always there. Chemists know that those lone pairs are always there. Um, and this, this, like I said, this becomes kind of important when you start looking at drawings and you're wondering why there's dots hanging out there. That's what they are. Those are lone pairs. So let's bring this back to sticky molecules. An intermolecular attraction. Now that we know what a molecule is, we can talk about an intermolecular attraction. Inter means between. An interstate goes between the states. An intermolecular attraction goes between molecules. They are the forces that cause the molecules to stick to each other. This is what causes stickiness. Now, the reason I didn't call them intermolecular attractions right away is, um, well, first of all, it's a, it's a mouthful. And second of all, stickiness can come from other things too. It's kind of a general term that I use. But most of the time, we're going to be talking about intermolecular attractions. These intermolecular attractions are going to determine many properties, whether something is a solid, liquid, or a gas. Remember, we looked at um, butane in a lighter, and then we looked at paraffin, which is like candle wax, and then we looked at hexane, which was just kind of um, a liquid on the table there. And those were all C's and H's, but one was a solid, liquid, and a gas. Intermolecular attractions can also determine boiling point, melting point, viscosity. That's something someone mentioned earlier. It's how thick the liquid is. Surface tension. That's how you a bug walks on it or how it stacks on a penny. Or volatility. I think a word that sounds really cool that means something really lame, how easily it evaporates is volatility. Um, there's some connections between here, like we mentioned. So boiling point, if something has a very high boiling point, it has a very low volatility. It doesn't evaporate as easily. Um, if you want to start working that out in your head, you can. If you want to go back to that tonight, you can. All right, now I am going to encourage you to be bilingual. I call them IMAs, intermolecular attractions. I also will call them IMFs. And I use these interchangeably because literally the world does. All right. Here is a picture that I pulled from online and it has an intermolecular force. If you want to get into the nitty gritty of it, because I know Sally might, an intermolecular attraction and an intermolecular force are almost the same thing. The attractive forces are stronger than the repulsive forces. So when you say intermolecular force, you're acknowledging that there is repulsion as well, but the attractive forces are always stronger and more important. So that's why they're pretty much interchangeable. All right, so this little picture here, it shows the in intra-molecular force, otherwise known as a bond. Okay, this is a bond between chlorine and hydrogen. We already established that. And then the intermolecular force, this is the force between two molecules. And that's relatively weak compared to a bond. Bonds are always stronger than the attractive force between the molecules. So a molecule's Stickiness can be determined by its force, its intermolecular attractions. I just, just to give you like a preview, I teach orgo, right? And I spend so much time talking about this because it's what affects real life. This is what affects real life that you can see at this age in your life more than anything else we're going to learn about in chemistry. All right. Liquids with stickier molecules. Stickier molecules is another way of saying high IMAs 
tend to have higher boiling points. Substances with very sticky molecules or very, very high IMAs tend to be solids at room temperature. This is what causes this stickiness. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what makes the IMAs? What makes things more sticky? Why did the lady in that video go on about the stickiness of the water molecules and that it was very polar? All right. So I have a pretty simple question for you. What makes things stick together or repel in science? I need you to walk back to maybe second or third grade. Um, I'm sure you played with these. Your teacher came in and your teacher was like, oh, look at it. They stick together. It's like magic. And if I flip it this way, they repel from each other. Magnetism. Yes, magnetism. So here's the thing. In second and third grade, you were learning about magnetism. And what you didn't realize is that your teachers were setting you up to learn about chemistry. Because the most important thing in chemistry is to remember the charges. A charge. Um, is it a magnetic charge? Yes. It's pretty much the exact same thing. And if you forgot about second or third grade, the positive end sticks to the negative end of the magnet and the positive end repels the positive end and they float apart from each other. I have magnets on my desk at work um, because literally teenagers love playing with magnets just as much as third graders. Ooh, they, they can't get enough of that feeling when they're like trying to push them together, but they won't go together. And so that's, it's the same thing. It's the charge. There are charged particles in chemistry that attract and repel each other. Now we've already talked about some charged particles, right? Reminder here, there's a nucleus, it's positive. It's surrounded by electrons, they're negative. So we've already got the conversation started about the charged particles. Now we're gonna talk about what happens when you get a lot of them together because chemistry does not happen one atom at a time. Now, the first one I wanna teach you is quite possibly one of the most confusing um, intermolecular attractions of all. It's the dispersion forces, all right? It is a attractive force that is present in all substances, polar, nonpolar, all substances. Everything has dispersion forces. Um, the heavier the molecule, the bigger the molecule, the more the dispersion force. That's what you need to know are those first two bullet points. If you want to know what a dispersion force is, I'll tell you about it. It's pretty cool. When you get a group of atoms bonded together, okay, we call that a molecule. doesn't matter what it is. It could be the simplest molecule in the book, okay? It could be O2. There it is, simplest molecule ever. It has electrons buzzing around it because that's the way chemistry works is these orbitals and buzzing electrons. And Heisenberg says, we don't know where they are and we don't know where they're going and that's okay. But what happens is that occasionally those buzzing electrons will just by chance end up on one side of the atom. Buzz, 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 buzz. And you'll get negative spot, negative spot, negative spot, negative spot. And where there's a negative spot, there's a, po a positive spot on the other end. So we call them instantaneous charges or instantaneous dipoles is another fancy word for it. It just means that every once in a while in every single atom on the planet, there's going to be instantaneous opportunities that there's going to be a charge. Um, instantaneous polarity, instantaneous charge, instantaneous dipoles. That's the first thing. The second type of IMA that I want to tell you about today is a dipole dipole attraction. I literally hate this word. I wish that they would rename it just to call it a polar attraction. That would be a much better word for it, a polar attraction. But unfortunately, I did not write the chemistry book, so I'm not allowed to rename it. It is called a dipole dipole attraction. And it happens 
when the molecule is polar. Now I'm not talking about um, oxygen anymore because oxygen is, is nonpolar. I have to talk about something that's polar. And you of course watched a little video and you saw that this is the world's most famous polar molecule, water. And so water has a positive end that's down here by the hydrogens. And it has a negative end up here by the oxygens. Now, if you're wondering what causes that, well, don't forget those lone pairs, right? And lone pairs are negative because lone pairs are made of electrons. So that's why that side of it is negative. So we have a whole molecule that has a positive side and a negative side. And what you get is you get these molecules. I like the way they drew them as little like weird eggy things because whoever this artist was doesn't care if it's water, if it's ammonia, if it's some huge molecule like glucose, they don't care. They're just showing us that the positive end is attracting the negative end of another molecule and the negative end is attracting the positive end. And then there's those repulsive forces they're stuck in there too, but they're not as important because they're not, they're just not as strong. If a repulsive force happens, it goes and then it sticks with the attractive force. So that's why they end up sticking like that. The positive side of one attracts the negative side of the other. So again, dispersion forces, all molecules, polar or nonpolar. The bigger the molecule, the heavier the molecule, the greater the dispersion forces because there's more opportunity for the electrons to group. Dipole, dipole attractions. This is a pretty strong attraction and it happens in polar molecules. A non-polar molecule has no net dipole, okay? It has no charged end specifically. It means that it just kind of floats around and it doesn't have like a positive end and a negative end. Molecules that are non-polar, do not exhibit dipole-dipole intermolecular attractions. That's why I'll, I'd rather call them polar IMAs, but nobody's on board with me. Okay, so I have some pictures here for you. Here's some polar molecules. Here's, oh, I'm a liar, sorry. Here's some non-polar molecules. Here's some polar molecules, okay? Polar, non-polar. You're going to have to get to the point where you're going to have to figure out just by looking at it, whether it's polar or nonpolar. So let's take a look at these and see if we can figure out just by looking what might make something polar or nonpolar. Okay. Now, before you come up with a idea. I want to draw one more nonpolar molecule on there that I wish I would have put because we've been talking about it all day. CH4 is nonpolar. All right. So CCl4, CH4, these are both nonpolar, no charge. CO2, no charge. O2, no charge. HCN, this is a carbon bonded to a nitrogen on one side and a hydrogen on the other. This sucker's polar. This is CCl3 with an H on it. This is polar. And then of course we have our ever famous H2O. Anybody got an idea of how you can tell the difference between polar and nonpolar molecules? Oh, Eric, you got an idea? Is that you raising your hand? I don't know. Is it the is it the bonds that they're showing? It's like uh like HCN and uh are the little lines that they're showing, like how they're bonded to? Well, so that's a good that's a good observation. Okay. We call this a triple bond. These are all single bonds. Um, over here is double bonds. So it actually doesn't matter whether it's double or triple or single bonds. Um, 
you can have polar things with double or triple or whatever. Jonah, do you have an idea? Any idea what could maybe make polar versus nonpolar? Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, can you go back to the polar slide just real quick? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm trying how about to we look at this one? Look at this one with the carbon in the middle versus this one with the carbon in the middle? Um, I guess, well, they both have carbon in the middle, so surrounded yep, by they're both two. three things with carbon in the middle. Um, I mean, uh, the other one looked like the carbon was larger, but that just might be the drawing, like the... Um, no, but it is showing you something in the drawing. It's showing you that the right, nitrogen here is like way bigger than the hydrogen. Bigger than the hydrogen, yeah. Right? So it's going out of its way to show you that it's bonded to two different things. All right? Carbon is bonded to nitrogen here. It's bonded to hydrogen here. Carbon's bonded to oxygen and oxygen, right? So if you start thinking about it like that, you can start seeing what we call symmetry. These are pretty even, Steven. This, not so much. Okay, let's look at like this one here. We've got the carbon bonded to the chlorines. This is carbon bonded to three chlorines, but then one of them is hydrogen, right? So that's the first thing you can use to determine if something is a polar molecule, what we call symmetry. Now, it's very important that we do not think of symmetry as just running like this, up and down, okay? Because this is a 3D world, so we have to think of symmetry as pulling in a three-dimensional direction, and that's really hard for me. Um, but then usually what students will do, oh, I went the wrong way. Usually students will look at this, and they'll be like, but wait a minute, Robles, this seems pretty, pretty symmetrical, right? It's pretty symmetrical. You got a hydrogen on one side and a hydrogen on the other side, but it's not. It's not symmetrical. And let me show you why. Remember those pesky lone pairs? And I said the lone pairs were like bonds of their own. You can think of that oxygen as being bonded to two lone pairs and then being bonded to two hydrogens. So now it's not symmetrical at all. So the two things that determine if a molecule is polar is shape. If there's lone pairs, it's polar. Done. Any lone pairs are going to be polar. And the second thing is symmetry. If you have, if you're lacking symmetry, and um, oh, sorry. If you look at those ones on the bottom, the CCl4 as opposed to the CH3Cl, one is non-polar, one is polar. Um, this one right here, son is knocking on the door. This one right here is polar because it doesn't have symmetry. This one is polar um, because it has lone pairs. This is non-polar, there are no lone pairs and we have symmetry. This one, polar, lone pairs. And these ones both don't have lone pairs, one has symmetry, one doesn't. Okay, so that's what you're gonna to start to look at when you look at molecular polarity. 